good afternoon everyone i welcome you all to the aosr emerging trends committee webinar now request you to the organizer to start this session over to you dr gaurang sir thank you so much sumit uh, good afternoon good evening and good morning to everybody who has joined us uh, from the different parts of the world for this exciting webinar of aosr uh, till the last few months we, we were doing very successful webinars on artificial intelligence and we decided to expand our horizons for the emerging trends and now we are starting a new series of emerging trends in imaging hardware the first of this series is the emerging trends in ultrasound imaging as we all know ultrasound is the bread and butter for most radiologists in different parts of the world and i would like to uh, warmly welcome all our speakers um, professor noriyuki tomayama uh, dr evelyn ma'am our past president and our emerging trends committee chairman uh, dr sharhan tang to this webinar uh, in the beginning i would like to request professor noriyuki uh, to give his opening remarks regarding uh, the emerging trends committee webinar uh, sir is the president of aosr welcome sir okay uh, thank you dr lavel uh, welcome to aosr emerging trend committee webinar uh, i'm noriki tomiyama from osaka university in japan and uh, i'm our aosr president yeah uh, first of all i'd like to thank uh, dr uh, dr tan and lavel uh, for preparing uh, this wonderful webinar yeah and uh, at this time, uh, we have a webinar about ultrasound, and we have three speakers. As you know, uh, now recently, uh, now um, uh, several AI softwares for AI have been released, and now we have we have a chance to use uh, these AIs. So uh, we are very exciting to have uh, this uh, webinar today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nyuriki, sir. Uh, Sumit, can we have the introductory slide for our first speaker, please? Yes, sir. Next slide, please. So our first lecture is by Dr. Yuji Akao. Uh, Dr. Gao is a consultant surgeon in liver, pancreas, and liver transplant surgery at the National University Hospital in Singapore as the assistant group of chief technology officer of the National University of Health System. Dr. Gao is involved in the research and development of immersive technology and its application in clinical care and education. He works extensively with mixed reality technology utilizing MR devices to deliver cutting edge capabilities to clinicians, including 3D holographic imaging, real-time computer vision-based image analysis, and multi-source data integration. He's also responsible for the integration and implementation of 5G wireless technology for hospital infrastructure development and building of secured high-speed integrated data network. Sir is going to uh, speak today on extending the reality for ultrasound in practice. Over to you, Dr. Gao. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good day, everyone. Very happy to be here. And thank you. A big thank you to the organizers for um, giving me this invitation. So today, I'm going to quickly talk about what we call holomedicine or using holography uh, technology in clinical practice. And the topic that I'm going to be focusing more on today is about extending the reality for ultrasound in practice. So um, I will skip this slide, just some disclosures before I begin. Right, so for us at the National University Health System, our journey with mixed reality began about two and a half years ago. And the whole reason why we set up this program as a strategic program within the hospital system was that we wanted to leverage on mixed reality and XR technology to improve um, clinical experience as well as enhance the, the care that's given to our patients. So not just for training and education, but also to bring about tangible benefits to the patients that we see every day. 
Um, so under this strategic program, we have different components, including clinical research and development, sci um, computer science or engineering R&D, as well as educational use cases and infrastructure processes and workflows that goes behind this entire program itself. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through what the main difference is between VR, AR and MR or mixed reality. So VR, AR, we're all quite familiar. Right? VR immerses you in a completely computer generated environment. Um, the downside is that you are cut off from the external world completely. Um, AR, on the traditional sense of AR, it's mostly a 2D display or a two-dimensional visual overlay onto a visor, which is usually just in one eye. It gives you some sense of information of the real world around you, um, but it doesn't actually, or what we would consider completely integrate the virtual and the physical reality. For mixed reality, this is kind of the enhancement or a combination of VR and AR, where for the first time we can fully or in a way try to integrate the virtual world with the physical world and using three-dimensional displays um, and 3D holograms instead of just a 2D visual display or 2D screen. So why mixed reality, right? Um, there are a few devices out there in the market um, that we would consider as true MR devices. One of them is the Microsoft HoloLens 2, which we use at NUHS, and the other one is the Magic Leap 2 that was just launched last year. Now, the main difference between MR devices and traditional VR, AR devices is essentially the, co the complexity and the advancement of the sensors, not just the screen itself, but the cameras, the various, um, for example, magnetometers, uh, infrared cameras, gyroscopes that's embedded within the devices that actually allows us to extract a lot more information um, of, of the world around us compared to just VR or traditional AR devices, right? So essentially what we capture from the cameras is something like this. It is not just one single video input, it is multiple video inputs coming in from at least six cameras on the device itself, including infrared cameras, depth cameras, 3D cameras. And it is because of this technology that we can use to integrate um, the various streams that's coming in from all the cameras and analyze those images in real time. So just gonna quickly run through how we are using it in the hospital itself. We've been running this program for the last two, two and a half years. And um, we've used it for uh, uh, about 100 cases so far, most of them in the operating theater. So we use it quite extensively for preoperative planning where you can upload the patient's CT scans, MRIs, any form of volumetric DICOM. And what it will display or show you is a three-dimensional representation of the patient's scan, either in its raw image, meaning the grayscale images that you see for CT MR, or in this case, this is a post segmented image where we run this, the images through a AI segmentation software. It shows you, for example, in this case, the inflow outflow for the liver, the various segments, and it allows you to plan for the surgery and to visualize the images in front of you in 3D and to appreciate the patient's anatomy in 3D. Right, so we use it quite extensively in the operating theater. So this is one of the examples where the cardiothoracic surgeons um, use it for minimally invasive cardiac bypass. They overlay and superimpose the patient's hologram on the patient during the surgery itself. And they use that as a form of image guidance uh, and image reference when they're making the incisions to insert their uh, um, operating ports. And because devices are completely transparent, it doesn't actually obstruct the view of the surgeon. And that's also one of the biggest advantages for this technology compared to traditional VR or AR technology and devices. Now, moving beyond that, right, we want to essentially explore what more we can do with this technology, apart from just having a nice 3D holographic display. So this is what the data science team or the engineering team in NHS is doing, where we are extracting the images, oops, sorry, the, the video feed from, from the cameras in real time, and we're analyzing them and processing them in real time using computer vision, either for tracking of objects in front of the field of view, or we even use infrared camera to isolate veins in the patient's hand, something like IQ vein and vein finder, but now it's actually on a 3D visor that you wear on your head. 
So this is kind of what led us to our ultrasound project, which we call Project Thea. And this is our, um, essentially our, our, our build and our project to develop a point of care ultrasound solution that is portable. Um, it sends a real-time feed to the Hall devices and to assist clinicians on the ground and to decentralize our ultrasound services from the radiology unit. Now, the reason why we decided to embark on this project was because of a few things, but the main, um, or, or, or the main problem we were trying to address is how do we declutter and how do we decentralize all the ultrasound scans that's being done in our radiology unit every year, right? So the, the first use case that we did was actually for thyroid. Um, NUH does about five to 6,000 thyroid ultrasounds every year. And most of them are essentially for screening or what we call routine follow-up scans, either six months, one year from the previous consult to look at thyroid nodules. Now this puts an incredible strain on the existing resources as well as especially the sonographers uh, where they have to do hundreds of these scans every day. And the patients wait up to two, three months for their appointment because the appointment slots are just so packed with all the scans, right? So why don't we just buy something off the shelf then? There are many solutions out there where they can do, for example, three-dimensional reconstruction of the ultrasound images. They can stream it to the HoloLens, but we tested many of these and none of them really fulfilled the criteria that we wanted, which is essentially a software application that combines all these um, capabilities into one single application. Right, so what we were looking for in our, in, in our project was to develop a solution that would give us, number one, an inline and in-plane projection of a live ultrasound image stream, meaning that the image of the ultrasound is actually displayed inside the patient. We needed something that could do real-time volumetric reconstruction, meaning that converting the 2D images into a 3D ultrasonic volume. The projection of, or, or, as well as a near real-time AI segmentation of the reconstructed 3D volume, and subsequently the projection of the segmented image or the reconstructed image back onto the patient so that we can use it for um, ultrasound-guided procedures, for example, FNACs. Now, there are a few what, what, what I'll call steps that we need to, to do to make sure that this application works. So these are numbers from one of our papers that was just published recently um, regarding this ultrasound solution. Now, the, one of the biggest challenges we had to overcome was the tracking of the ultrasound probe itself, right? So using the cameras on the HoloLens, um, we essentially created a new way of tracking using the stereoscopic cameras as well as the Arco um, QR, QR code markers, you can see here on the right side. And we use essentially a dual tracking method to know where the position of the ultrasound probe is, right? Because knowing the position as well as the location of the ultrasound probe in time and space is important for the 3D reconstruction and subsequent projection. Right? So once we could get the marker tracking in place, the next step for us to do is that we have to make sense of the markers and to make sure that the accuracy of the marker, of, of tracking of the marker is as high as possible. Number one, to make sure that the image that we project onto the patient is within millimeters or sub-millimeter accuracy in order to guide procedures. And number two, we have to make sure that the tracking of the images are accurate in order for us to have an accurate 3D reconstruction of the ultrasound suite. So based on the tests that we have done, the numbers at the bottom are essentially what the, the, the accuracies that we could achieve when it comes to um, the application that we have built. So with a stereoscopic cameras, as well as two um, QR code or R code markers, we could get a translational um, margin of error or deviation down to one, about 1.08 millimeters with a rotational margin of error of 1.3 degrees. But if let's say we increase that to a stereoscopic tracking with five different markers, we could actually get the translational tracking down to an accuracy of about 0.5 millimeters and a rotational accuracy of about 0.6 millimeters. So this is kind of well within the threshold of what is considered acceptable and much better than what some of the industrial uh, or, or the, the available off the shelf um, you know, trackers as well as volumetric reconstruction software applications that you can get off the market at this point in time. 
So I'm going to show you a quick video, uh, essentially, of the application that we have developed. Now, I, I can't show you the entire thing because this is still a prototype and we are still developing it at, at the moment. But essentially, this is what you're going to see through the visor itself. And this is how we use the ultrasound. And after it, um, you know, the tracking of the QR code, the streaming of the ultrasound images to the patient. The image that you see now has a little bit of deviation. Um, this is mainly because of the recording itself. Um, but if you look through the visors, the projection essentially is right at the edge of the ultrasound probe. So what we do is that, for example, in this case, we can do a sweep of the area of interest, right? This is of the hand. We've been trying it out in our thyroid clinics as our part of our POC. And once the sweep is completed, and after you run the, the model through a AI segmentation algorithm, this is kind of what you get here, right? So after the completion of the sweep of the neck, we can actually segment out the thyroid. This is the trachea. And then after that, this is what it looks like through the hololens itself. And of course, the aim to, for this is to be able to project this patient, this image back onto the patient to guide procedures. For example, you know, doing an FNA or any form of ultrasound guided IR procedures or bedside procedures in that for that matter. So once we've developed the application, the next question that came to us was how do we actually scale this, right? When we first developed the application, we were running it off a laptop that was connected to the HoloLens 2 device mainly because we needed to stream the images and to process the images in real time. And the HoloLens 2 just doesn't have the compute power to do that, right? But the problem is, if let's say we want to deploy this throughout the hospital, it is not possible for us to deploy laptops or workstations everywhere just to support this. So this is when we started our um, exploration into sort of offloading the compute from the HoloLens itself and the laptop onto the cloud. So this allows us to reduce our physical footprint when it comes to computational requirements. And at the same time, it allows us to scale at a much faster and a much lower cost solution compared to you know, using a laptop or a workstation. Now, once we've solved the compute part, we have to solve the issue about data transmission, right? Because we are sending large amounts of data, uh, video files as a live stream to the cloud and retrieving the segmentations and information back from the cloud. We needed a system that was secure and robust and high speed so that we do not experience any lag or, or issues along the way. Because remember, if we are doing this in the clinic, uh, we are actually sending identified patient information to the cloud and then retrieving it back. So it has to be secure. So this is when we decided to embark on our 5G project where we develop a private indoor 5G network that will allow medical equipment within NUHS to connect to a high speed, low latency network that is private, that is secure and behind six to seven layers of firewall. And this is the first network that actually allows us to transmit identified patient information um, on an internet-enabled device, which is the HoloLens 2. So as first, as the phase one of our implementation, we have retrofitted 10 of our operating theaters as well as the um, post-op anesthesia unit with its own private indoor 5G radio dots. So this will allow the anesthetist to use the ultrasound um, solution within the OT as well as the PACU for all their procedures, for example, central line setting. And we have also retrofitted four of our inpatient wards with its own 5G antenna. And this will allow us to do, for example, basic ultrasound scans for the patients, and we don't have to send them to the DDI unit. Right. And on the background of all those, we develop um, together with Singtel, IMD, Microsoft, and Apoclar, um, we develop essentially an automated network that will allow us to retrieve information from our intranet to our what we call to our private cloud, which is what we call the healthcare commercial cloud. And with that link up to the HoloLens 2, which lies in the internet, as well as our H computer or Azure uh, multi-H multi computing services in the Singtel data center. And essentially what we have, what we will be doing is to is install and deploy our algorithms as well as our applications within the H computer. So that anyone within the hospital that has a 5G access to our private network can, ac can access this H compute and live stream the information back and forth and run the analysis in real time. So this network has actually just been um, deployed on Tuesday. 
and we have signed it off with, and we have actually already started using this network for um, 5G communication. Now, of course, there are a lot of hurdles, um, additional hurdles that we need to cross and to jump over before this becomes what we would consider a, a commonplace in clinical practice. I mean, technology readiness is definitely one thing. Right? Um, mixed with MR devices, and you know, even with his current generation, most of the cameras are not accurate enough to maintain a steady track of the probes. Um, tracking is one thing. We still have to solve the issues about accurate projection of the images back onto the patient and through the visor itself. Data, data security, governance, user acceptance, system acceptance, all of these are challenges that we need to face before you know, innovations and, and um, new developments like this can be a commonplace in clinical practice. Now, of course, this is a very famous quote. The best way to predict your future is to create it. And um, my last slide is just a, a appreciation to the team, both the engineering as well as the clinical teams for the Holomedicine team that's been working so hard on this project for the last one and a half to two years to bring it to the stage that we have at this point in time. And that is the end of my presentation. Hope you guys enjoyed it and um, happy to take any questions at the end of the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Now, for such a wonderful lecture. It felt as if we were in some uh, Spielberg movie. <laughs> and it's uh, times are really exciting. Uh, I think we'll take all the questions at the end and we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, Sumit, can we have the slide, please? I would like to next welcome Mr. Chad McLennan. Chad is the president and ex chief executive owl at Kios Medical Inc an AI software and life sciences company empowering physicians with clinically proven deep learning algorithms and decision support tools in the fight against cancer worldwide. Working with the physicians from across the globe, Chad's team at Kios Medical is helping democratize early cancer detection and diagnosis, saving countless lives, along with what will ultimately become billions in wasteful over-treatment spending that can be repurposed to elevate care and quality of life. He's a seasoned executive with a track record of working with leading technology and healthcare focused organizations. He has recently developed a TEDx talk discussing how machine learning is transforming radiology. When not there in New York, Chad is working closely with physicians, engineers, healthcare leaders from Memorial Sloan Catering to the American Hospital in Dubai and beyond, expanding the innovative capabilities of Kios in partnership with companies such as GE, Philips, Fuji, CareStream, and many others. I would like Chad to come and deliver a talk on AI augmented ultrasound applications. Welcome, Chad. Thank you. I'm sharing now. You can hear me all right? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay, terrific. Uh, fantastic. That was uh, incredibly exciting, uh, Dr. Gao. Uh, learned a lot and uh, we should talk, that's uh, fascinating. Um, I'm here to talk about emerging trends, AI augmented applications. So thank you for this opportunity. As you saw, I'm the work with the team here at Kios Medical here in New York City with deployments around the world. We like to talk about how this AI journey that we're on is one that we began over a decade ago. So even though you might hear about us now for the first time, it was about you know almost 11, 12 years in the making. Multiple patents, multiple FDA clearances, multiple CE marks, multiple indications, and a vendor agnostic software that leverages data from across you know, multiple manufacturers uh, representing uh, a wide spectrum of ethnicities with some of the leading clinical experts helping advise building software that we describe ourselves as the engineers. And it's informed and designed by physicians for physicians. We we're also fortunate enough to be a finalist in the best radiology software of the year just last year. But I wanna talk a little bit more about the AI landscape. What you just saw is fascinating new advancements and they're more and more coming at an increasingly rapid rate. 
I went to the folks at Signify, you may be familiar. They conduct a lot of research in medical imaging. They talk about the positive outlook and even governments are now getting into the game. We're contacted regularly to discuss the implications across entire populations. AI continues to garner interest from clinicians with asking for assistance in everything from image guidance to workflow efficiency. But the area we focus on is about enabled decision support, augmented decision support. They estimate it's going to have the largest market impact, improving diagnostic accuracy and treatment while also reducing unnecessary biopsies. We couldn't agree more and we're seeing it in the evidence today. I mentioned the AI landscape. When you look across the human anatomy, the applications for ultrasound, ultrasound generates data and that's what we work with. We work with data that we can extract, anonymize and analyze. Just as our many colleagues are in the area of echo and cardio, in breast, there are hardware and software players. There's a new wearable option. In thyroid, as you just saw, ultrasound is critical to accurately classifying suspicious thyroid nodules in the ob gyne space and others. Here's one I'd like to highlight in the ob gyne and prenatal screening and diagnosis a French company doing some fantastic multi-dimensional, multi-modal models to predict and diagnose deformities accurately and earlier impacting life. That's why we're all here. The point of care side, we just saw a fantastic presentation. There's been tremendous advancements in the quality, the image quality, the speed, which allows us to have data for interpretation. This is the GE V-Scan Air. There's the butterfly device you may be aware of, Philips Lumify, Clarius. I mentioned the new wearables, and as you just saw, even mixed reality. <clears throat> Why is all this development happening? We've heard about how it's a big data play. There's more data available. Since we digitized, we have the ability to manipulate data. The conversion of compute, the ability to do things with GPUs that were previously unthinkable, that used to take weeks, can now take seconds. There's other reality around practice that is a driving force behind this. And the reality is variability. We know presented with the interpretation of a black and white grayscale image, physicians may not necessarily be in 100% agreement. Two heads are better than one. Three heads are better than one. Several hundred, which is the equivalent of what software can create, can really drive down that variability. And not only will physicians disagree with one another, that variation happens within each of us. We've proven how we can disagree with ourselves. We can see the same case a month later, six months later, and render a completely different interpretation and diagnosis. So as Deming said, that uncontrolled variation is the enemy of quality. We know that ultrasound volumes are growing. We see it in the numbers. We feel it every day in the practice. Here in the US, 80% of the healthcare systems are reporting shortages in the radiology department. And there's other forces behind the growth. And as the previous presentation indicated, it tr places tremendous stress on the system. There's new regulations here that we expect to see in other parts of the world that are already happening about use of ultrasound for supplemental screening in breast exams. National reporting standards are going in. That's creating more and more stress on a system where the workforce is flat and in some cases down. I apologize, this is a US statistic only. 
but we see that it replicates itself around the world in the analysis of a thyroid nodule. And before we have mixed reality to help increase our accuracy, we see a large number of fine needle aspirations come back either inconclusive or benign. For breast biopsies, similar, but quite, not quite so inaccurate, but still four out of five come back as benign and we're still missing cancers every day. These are cancers that could be detected and treated much earlier at a fraction of the expense with much improved patient outcomes. More of the reason why not missing a cancer reduces stress in the physician. Patients don't want follow-up procedures or procedures that could be avoided. There's cost and there's life impacting implications. So what's the solution? Is there a possibility that we can all collaborate, bringing the best minds together and find a way to help address many of these challenges and maybe more? We've devised what we describe as smart ultrasound. The way you have a smartphone, the way there are smart devices, ultrasound can now be much more intelligent through the use of AI to classify suspicious lesions in a fraction of the time that physicians spend documenting, dictating, reporting, and treating. This isn't easy. As I mentioned, this is leveraging data, large volumes of data. At present, we have 2 million images and it's growing regularly. Those are ultrasound exams sourced from around the world, complete with reports and interpretations and panels of experts to help make sure that that data is labeled properly, accurately, and curated. Over 50 sites are contributing to this around the world to ensure generalizability on a global basis. And these models, these models are fascinating. Everyone asks, tell me about your algorithm. I say, which one? There's multiple algorithms, a concert of algorithms, an ensemble that work together and analyze data at a pixel, pixel level that sees things that are invisible to the human eye. Our eyes play tricks on us. And that second opinion, that third opinion, that 10th opinion helps see things that can oftentimes be missed. Where have we focused the effort? We've focused the effort here in this diagnostic follow-up where that critical decision between letting something go, biopsy, or just following. We've developed software with the input from our user physicians from around the world that first and foremost had to be easy to use, fast, and intuitive. The other thing that's really important as we all think about how we work together is all trying to speak the same language. The language of breast exams is virads. The language of thyroid is typically tyrads or ATA with similar frameworks. So we've built the software to translate statistics into the language of radiology of birads and tyrads. So a type birads two is benign, three is suspicious, malignant is four C plus. But the accuracy of the data, the accuracy of the interpretation only takes you so far. As that brilliant network that was described earlier that must create the speed so that there's no latency We've said if it doesn't work in the workflow, it doesn't work. So this rendering here on the screen is the Kios button as it exists directly on a GE Logic scanner on the touch screen. I've had a physician tell me that the only disruption to the workflow was reminding the tech or the physician to push the button. And in pushing that button, you get an instantaneous interpretation at a pixel level of those 17,000 features rendered to your desktop in seconds. 
other workflow integrations, automated breast ultrasound at the workstation. The owl there is to remind you that the wise owl that sees in the dark, that is a bird of prey that goes after cancer, is there at your fingertips. We go from the work list into the report, taking image data off of a Philips scanner, simply using the calipers, designating the region of interest, and create what we've heard physicians describe as a digital biopsy, an e-biopsy, taking image data rather than physical tissue, sending it to a suite, an ensemble of algorithms instead of a physical pathology lab and getting you back an interpretation that's incredibly accurate. We can't stop there. We know how much pressure is on the clinical workforce with the growing workload. That information you see on your screen is essentially what you need for your report. So our layers of engineering not only take the data to build the models, to generate the findings, we can extract that data and export it directly into your reporting system at the push of a button. And most folks that are interpreting thyroid nodules know that half of those exams have multiple nodules. So the savings and the consistency compounds by allowing the system to do the interpretation and exporting. Let me show you quickly what this looks like in real time, in practice. It's taking that digital tissue sample, putting it on the virtual glass, and instantly sending it to the pathology lab for an interpretation. Right there, you get the findings in front of you. You can complete your report. This can be prepared by a tech and a radiologist can go back in and make adjustments as needed and rerun the interpretation. It can be copied, pasted, or exported field by field. And at the bottom there, we even have a CPT code for reimbursement here in the US to assist with billing and payment. So how well does it work? People ask, how accurate is it? And I say, yes. Obviously, as we know, the accuracy varies based on the underlying sample. We try to take tough samples and we use the best of the best when we do our studies. We're talking about trends. I like to describe this as a trend that's rapidly becoming a trajectory based on the evidence. Eight peer-reviewed retrospective studies, prospective studies, posters and abstracts, 50 plus and more validation studies at many of the leading institutions around the world. We're pleased to find that this is not just for a general radiologist. As I mentioned, the best of the best, many of the hand-picked folks who are brilliant clinicians, proven, were part of these studies that show that even the most experienced get a little bit better. And what does it mean to get better? It means catching more cancer and avoiding biopsies that are unnecessary. That's the beauty of machine learning is that these models can be designed and optimized to do both. Both be good at catching cancer and be good at identifying benign without what was previously a zero sum proposition. As I mentioned, our studies are not three, not five, often 15 readers, all experience levels. We wanted a solution that can help everyone. What are the benefits to patients? Obviously, earlier detection, improved outcomes, less stress. Physicians want reduced interpretation time, automating the reporting and accuracy as well. And we're finding now the reason I mentioned at the outset that governments are looking to modernize and implement with AI because it's clear that this is a new paradigm. This trend is becoming a trajectory. It will improve quality of care. It'll increase efficiency, reduce that variability and reduce even liability. 
As I mentioned, it works within the workflow. We sit in between. We partner with all types of hardware and reporting systems and integrate with PACS. These are the major players. You're familiar with many of these. I'm sure that you have them within your facilities. Many of the forward thinking, you're not alone. If you're thinking about this, you're not alone. But you can hear and listen to me, but it's much better when you talk to your peers. What are your peers saying? This was broadcast here in New York City on CBS Evening News that artificial intelligence has the ability to make us even better physicians than we might otherwise be. Being willing to look for ways to improve, ways that you weren't necessarily trained on, ways that are uncomfortable and new. That's what innovation is all about. One of my favorite quotes was from a physician in Singapore, analyzed the nodule and saw for himself the power of the utilization of AI to assist and augment in the decision-making and the reporting so you can spend more time with patients and be involved in more complex activities. So we're talking about trends. Is this trend or foe? Truly believe this trend is our friend. We've heard this many times, but will AI replace radiologists? The right answer is that radiologists who use AI will be replacing those who don't. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chad, for such a wonderful lecture. And the ending note was really very inspiring for everyone of us here. And I do believe that eventually every radiologist would adopt to such wonderful uh, AI practices, especially in ultrasound. Uh, thank you so much. So before we head for the panel discussion, I would like Sumit to display uh, the QR code for the feedback uh, for our audiences. Um, after that, we'll go for the panel discussion and audiences can give their feedback using the QR code. Uh, also, the link to the feedback has been shared with the audience in their chat boxes. Please scan the QR code and give the feedback to get a certificate from uh, the Emerging Trends Committee of AOSR regarding uh, your participation as delegates. I would again like to remind everybody, especially the participants, uh, to please give their feedbacks as it is very necessary uh, part and uh, essential to get your certificate. Thank you, Sumit. Uh, I would now invite Dr. Evelyn Ma'am, uh, former uh, past president, and uh, Dr. Sher Han Tang and Nori Sarar, beloved president of AOSR uh, for the panel discussion. and also our speakers. So any, any questions uh, we would like to start off the discussion with? Okay, uh, Dr. Sharan, thank please, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all the lecturers, uh, wonderful and very captivating and uh, certainly a lot of insights. What I really like about today's lecture is we are really going into the frontier of the practice of ultrasound. And uh, perhaps a first question to Dr. Gao. Um, so the, uh, the use of VR or uh, mixed reality, um, or rather mixed reality uh, rather than VR, um, you have shown that possibly it can be applied in uh, surgery. Um, can I have your insights on which anatomic regions uh, would be best suited for such a technology using the ultrasound as an overlay? Right. I, um, I, at the moment, I think 
um, rigid structures or organs that are not you know, very mobile would be more suitable. Um, reason being that once you acquire the image, it's, it becomes a static image, right? regardless of how you do it, whether it's a, you know, 2D or, or 3D reconstruction. Um, if you're streaming it live, of course, it doesn't matter. But once you want to use it for anything else, a like projection, it becomes static. Thing. So the, the organs that we're using it now when it comes to MR technology, maybe not specific to ultrasound, are, a, are organs that are not so mobile, for example, the brain, um, the liver, in the rectum area. So these are more fixed in nature. Um, moving ahead, of course, we have to essentially look at how we can potentially include other organs as well. Um, so that's the part where the, the AI um, deformability modeling comes in, right? How do you predict how an organ is going to behave when you when you manipulate it, when you subject it to external forces, and and that's where uh, I I guess the research into virtual twins or digital twins is going to be very useful. And one of the projects that we're doing now is to create try and create a virtual twin of the liver, um, at least for now, doing a structural and anatomical virtual twin of the liver. Um, using biomechanical properties that we can extract for, for, for example, CT scans, MRI scans, and imputing those into a FEM model to create a computational model of the liver that's specific to that patient. Right? Once we have the computational model, then the next step, what we can do is essentially image fusion. Right? I, using ultrasound as a landmarking and a wayfinding we can superimpose the patient's volumetric scans, for example, CT scans, MRI scans, based on on-table ultrasound results. We match the landmarks, and that gives you a reference of how to overlay and superimpose the patient's uh, volumetric image, right? And then using a digital twin that can be used for, for example, surgical guidance. Right? But at this point in time, mainly because of both hardware as well as computational limitations, um, organs that are more superficial are, of course, easier to, to image, which is why we chose the thyroid um, to, to start our pilot project. With. Initially, we wanted to do on the liver, but it's quite difficult, especially if you're doing an outpatient. You have the rib shadows and everything, and to, dry, and to try and do a 3D recon of the liver with external ultrasound is it, extremely challenging. So we chose the thyroid. Um, of course, vascular structures, for example, you know, for uh, arteriovenous fistula um, creations, you can do a recon on the table itself. So at least for now, um, we are a little bit restricted to superficial, you know, not so mobile um, organs and structures. But of course, with time, as we develop this technology, as we build what we will call the virtual and digital twins and predictive analytics, um, even, you know, fully mobile organs will at some point in time be applicable for, for this technology. Yeah. Thank you, that's very exciting. Maybe a, a hand over to the other um, moderators for questions, thanks. I, I have one question uh, for all uh, three of the speakers and their insights. And for years, I have been fascinated with the idea that why uh, cross-sectional imaging can't be integrated into ultrasound or is anybody doing it? Uh, just like a CT scanner, can we build an ultrasound machine which would not be a user dependent, which can scan large body parts uh, with cross sections? Is it possible? Yeah, maybe. Um, shall we direct that question to Professor Chow? Professor Chow, I think we're also very interested in what triggered your uh, research into this field of ultrasound. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Sir Hing, uh, for organizing this uh, uh, you know, wonderful workshop. And thank you for the invitation. I truly enjoyed the previous talks, learned a lot. Uh, now, uh, for this uh, specific uh, question, uh, so, uh, so now we are talking about something, uh, tomography, uh, yes. 3D imaging uh, yes. with uh, ultrasound. Uh, I would say that's uh, possible. Uh, especially with uh, multiple window of uh, this uh, ultrasound that uh, what we are uh, doing. Uh, so you can now, instead of using one ultrasound probe, uh, there can be multiple ultrasound probe uh, yeah. on the body, uh, on a specific organ. Indeed, uh, we actually achieve uh, certain results. Uh, we just have now to uh, you know, integrate in, them into a, 
uh, 3D uh, tomography uh, image yet, but uh, I believe uh, that's uh, possible. Uh, so uh, I think the previous uh, challenge is, uh, you know, you have one single imaging window, and then you when you move this imaging window uh, around the body, uh, probably you cannot get a very consistent uh, data, and it can be user dependent. Uh, but uh, uh, with uh, the capability of bioadhesive ultrasound, uh, you can mitigate and uh, alleviate uh, lots of those challenges. Uh, then uh, you know integrating uh, AI, uh, you know to do adjustments uh, to do uh, you know three uh, D uh, tomography. Uh, I would say it is uh, possible. But uh, uh, now then it's about the clinical need. Uh, whether we truly need such a three D uh, image. Uh, uh, by the way. Uh, there, so for example, some uh, you know uh, this uh, kind of two uh, D matrix uh, ultrasound probe can also have some uh, you know locally three uh, D imaging capabilities, right? There are already uh, you know devices there can do certain three D imaging capabilities also. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. I think uh, Garang in the breast we have three D yeah. ultrasound. Yeah. So it is presented, it looks like an MRI images and you can just section it and you can do oblique plane. And it does, however, take a lot of time because we are learning how to use it better. But it is actually very, very, um, I would say it makes life easier because you can present all your oh. multiple lesions almost always consistently when you're doing follow-up. So it is available for the breast, but it is a superficial organ. I think yeah. Gaurang has a lot more in idea is that how are we going to... Like how do we get around the fact that you have bones that are not going to allow ultrasound yeah. to penetrate? I think that those are the that, questions we have. Mean. So I think, uh, Dr. Zhao, you mentioned full body, continuous ultrasound monitoring. And maybe you can expand a little bit for our audience who is probably a little bit uh, flabbergasted by how much ultrasound is at the frontier, seriously. Uh, and maybe uh, the, in fact, I would say that it will be wonderful because you know white coat hypertension, where we get what high blood pressure every time we go and see the doctor because we are nervous. So your real-time yeah. monitoring is actually going to be so useful so that when we diagnose hypertension, it is really we have hypertension in our daily work and, and going about. So maybe you can explain to us a little bit more about that whole body, full time monitoring. Yeah, thank you, Evelyn, for the uh, great question. So uh, full body imaging means, uh, you know, there are many organs of the body uh, uh, compatible with ultrasound imaging, right? The current practice is a clinician will handhold the ultrasound probe, right? Uh, then do a snapshot imaging one organ each time, right? Uh, so that's the current practice. It's already very powerful diagnostic tool. Our current vision is uh, you can adhere this uh, you know similar quality of uh, this uh, thin rigid ultrasound probe. So this is not the stretchable one. Right? Give you very low imaging quality. This is a high quality you know uh, imaging. Uh, adhere them to diverse locations of the body, uh, and then uh, you know when uh, sonography uh, do this ultrasound, they also tune this to optimize the imaging direction. Right. Uh, so it's not conformal to the skin we can tune the optimized imaging direction of all these ultrasound probes. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, with the uh, control system, you can synchronize how they image, right? You don't need to, uh, you know, send this ultrasound power, you know, uh, simultaneously. There can be some time difference, but uh, you can continuously image diverse organs of the body, uh, let's say over days. So that's our vision. We believe this is possible. We are getting preliminary data already uh, because uh, currently EKG patch, right? we adhere this EKG patch on the body already you know, uh, for a long-term uh, you know, diagnosis of this uh, you know, EKG data, but it is only linear data, but uh, adhering patches to the body is not something new. So patient will accept it. Uh, now uh, with our uh, preliminary data, on the low power level and the high imaging performance of this bioadhesive ultrasound, uh, we believe this will uh, become uh, something uh, real, right? My lab only uh, uh, published real papers. So within, uh, let's say five to 10 years, uh, we are maturing the whole system. We are translating this into a commercially available product. Okay. Okay. Dr. Sher, uh, yes. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, fantastic. Um, I, I also like to ask uh, Chad, because uh, Chad, in your talk, you had described a little bit about the use of uh, AI algorithms in uh, breast ultrasound. Um, interestingly, somebody asked me recently whether it was possible for ultrasound of the breast to be a first-line imaging modality over mammograms. Um, and my immediate answer was there isn't evidence right now. The, the worry is too many false positives. Um, but what do you think? I mean, you you have shown that you could increase the accuracy and the performance of the, the radiologist. Um, makes me wonder, were you in our office just yesterday? We're having some of these discussions with the US FDA. Uh, <laughs> nah, I mean, we're just, we're, we, we couldn't be more excited when you think about, you know, one, one of the ways I described this to a minister of health, I said, traditional ultrasound, right? We understand, we, we as humans did the best we could with the tools that we had. We now have the ability to have MRI quality sensitivity with fewer false positives. And that's why we call it smart ultrasound. So the implications are profound. So first line screening, absolutely. We will be able to catch more, you know, high 90s sensitivities, which, you know, with a human in control, it rivals any other modality. So we're, we're, we want to maintain this partnership with physicians, but that frontline screen is clearly an opportunity to, you know, enhance at a population level, early detection miss fewer cancers. And at the same time, when I heard about something taking two to three months for a follow-up, we've had folks go through their BIRADS threes and downgrade 40% because they're unnecessary follow-ups. So let patients not have to deal with the stress and the anxiety of those follow-ups. And the clinicians can now be focused on the patients who need the care the most. Thank you. Great answer. Back to Gaurang. Thank you. I, I have one additional question just in line of this. If uh, any hospital uh, worldwide wants to adopt this smart AI in ultrasound, what are the costs involved for an institution typically? So the, the costs for the institution are mostly in, in all of the decision making that can take months to years <laughs> to actually deploy. The online, the actual running of the applications are very low cost. Okay. Right. So the 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 cost is a fraction. Right. In fact, we we we've we've heard a term. Right. There was always this FOMO. I fe I'm fear of missing out on AI. Now the folks that have been using it for a while have done the analysis. They call it COMO. What's the cost of missing out? Oh. So the cost is greater to not do it than to do it. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, I'm so impressed by uh, by three um, excellent presenters. Yeah, uh, uh, all all presentations are like a sci-fi story for me. Yeah, and um, uh, I I have a question uh, to uh, Doctor uh, Chad McLeman. Yeah, so. Um, I read a uh, I read a uh, paper uh, recently published on radiology, uh, comparing the accuracy of mammography between a uh, radiologist and AI for screening. The result was uh, the accuracy was same between radiology and AI. So in Japan, most uh, ultrasound examinations are done by uh, technologists and technicians, uh, yeah, not doctors. Yeah, and uh, after that we have to um, double check uh, the uh, ultrasound images. Uh, it is sometimes very difficult to uh, make a diagnosis only by images. Yeah, so because uh, I don't know um, uh, diagnos uh, diagnostic accuracy um, uh, depends on their their. Um, uh, the ability of technicians, I think. So uh, I think AI can uh, can help a lot yeah, for the diagnosis of AI images uh, done by technologists, I think. How do you think about this? Well, I, 
I know what I think, but I also like knowing what we see in practice. And it's backed up by the evidence and the data that physicians, when they're using the AI, are significantly and meaningfully, statistically more accurate and more precise. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we do is we don't use AI yet to actually enhance the image. But imagine a model that was built on 2 million images with data that dates back 15, 20 years, and it can be just as accurate on older equipment and new equipment. And we do self-supervised learning to, to manipulate the data in a way that makes it generalizable across varying levels of image quality. We published a paper that showed accuracy at a, at a meaningful level on handheld prior generation devices. So when you extrapolate that off across text acquiring images and a wide range of experience levels, we see that you know, all the boats rise with the tide. So AI helps the best of the best get a little bit better, but everyone gets better. And it varies based on you know, time of day. I, I talk to our folks, don't go in and talk to the radiologist about this at 9 a.m. They're caffeinated and ready to go. Four o'clock in the mm-hmm. afternoon, yeah, they might be willing to say, yeah, I could use a little assistance from AI today. Mm, okay, thank you. I have a question for uh, Dr. Yujia. Uh, with the Apple's uh, Vision Pro coming in, uh, and uh, I'm sure that many other companies will now uh, jump this bandwagon. Uh, how do you see your application or these applications uh, programming be different for adaptation to different uh, VR sets or could it be same or Apple could have an edge? What are your views on that? Mm. Right. So I, I think when it comes to developing the application, um, we do try to make it as cross-platform compatible as possible. Um, because we don't want it to be restricted to, for example, a single device. Um, The issues that we face is that not all devices out there have the same level of hardware um, capabilities as compared to some of the more expensive models, right? So for example, when it comes to even for this ultrasound um, application, in order to track the marker itself, you need a very high resolution camera um, that is able to, to keep a continuous track on the marker and to make sure that the tracking is accurate, right? So a lot of consumer type devices, for example, even the, the for uh, you know, Quest Pro, MetaQuest, all this, they have external cameras, but these cameras are not accurate enough for us to use it for marker tracking, especially if you want to use it in the medical sense, right? Because we have to bear in mind that these devices out there right now, they were never developed for medical use cases, right? They were developed for industry. They were developed for production lines, and most of them are for commercial. Even for the um, Apple Vision Pro device, I mean, one thing or one of the things that, that I sort of um, spotted when they did their whole press release is that every single use case that Apple has highlighted was a consumer use case, right? Nothing in their press release or the release video actually pointed towards a commercial use or even a healthcare application, right? So that essentially tells you where the companies are targeting, the target audience. And that also essentially gives us a rough idea of what kind of sensor suite we can expect from devices like that, because they're not going to put in a, you know, put in, for example, four um, depth cameras with 4K capability and wide view, um, you know, um, IR sensors for a consumer device, but you want those in commercial devices. Right? The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that when it comes to medical use cases, meaning that we are using it on patients, Um, There are limitations when it comes to using devices like the Apple Vision Pro or even the the Quest 3. Um, Essentially, these are what I would consider VR devices with a camera pass through. So they they say that you can have a vision of the outside world, but it is dependent on the camera sending you a video image of the outside world. Now, there's two problems with that. One is that it still limits your field of view. Um, because the camera is not going to have the same type of peripheral vision that a human eye has. Uh, number two, it is very much dependent on the resolution of the camera. Even with 4K cameras, 
beyond a certain distance, you're not going to get the same amount of resolution that you get on the human eye. Um, the third thing that we find is probably going to be the most important is actually patient safety and situational awareness. Right? With devices like, for example, the HoloLens 2 or the Magic Leap 2, if, let's say, the device fails while you're using it, you do not lose situational awareness. You lose your virtual overlay, but you can still see the physical world. Meaning that if I'm in the middle of a procedure, I will still be able to carry on based on what I used to do, just that now I don't have the additional aids of the, the virtual objects. If let's say we apply the same using the Vision Pro or the Meta Quest, you know, or the Quest 3, essentially a pass-through device, if the camera stops working, if the device stops working, you lose all vision and all situational awareness of anything that's happening around you. And you need to take out the device to see again. Right? So that's one problem. And if you're in the middle of a procedure to stop, drop everything, take it out, that may not be the safest because you may not be able to actually let go of something. And the usability was something that we emphasize on a lot when we essentially, and that's one of the reasons why we went ahead with, with the Microsoft HoloLens 2 was because most VR devices, because of the way they are constructed or even the new Vision Pro and all this, um, people wearing spectacles, depending on the size of the spectacles, you may or may not be able, be able to put it on, right? And the problem is even with the Vision Pro is that you need specialized inserts in order for you to take out your spectacles to use it. Now, from a consumer's perspective, you're, if you're using it for personal use, that's fine. But if, let's say, you're using it for healthcare and you have one device that's being shared by multiple users, it means that I have to create special prescription inserts for every single doctor and nurse in the hospital in order for them to use these devices. Right? So from a cost perspective, it doesn't really make sense for us to do it. Right? So I, I think whenever we deploy technology like this, the user interface and the user experience, as well as what we're using it for, plays a very big role in us deciding what kind of device that we use and what is suitable. Uh, it may not be the most advanced or the most capable out there in the market at the moment, but right? the HoloLens 2, it doesn't have the best processor. It doesn't have you know, necessarily the best high, defi high definition cameras, but it is the entire package and the entire ecosystem that essentially works for what we want to use it for. Right? So I, I think in terms of the future markets, in terms of the scalability and whether or not there'll be increased adoption, um, it really depends on what we intend to use it for. For education as well as training, I think VR devices are good enough. You don't need something that's too complex. But if let's say you're going to use it for an interventional role, right? you're going to use it on actual patient intervention and procedures, then you need something that is highly complex. The sensors must be accurate enough for us to get the tracking and the projection that we need. And of course, there must be a fail safe if let's say the device stops working halfway. So that's kind of my, my views and opinions when it comes to you know, all the devices that's out there in the market at the moment. Few questions we have uh, from the speaker, uh, for the speakers. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Gao, which anatomical regions are best suited for, uh, so that I think we did. Uh, another question, how many healthcare institutions without sophisticated 5G networks leverage on technology for patient care? Right, so um, it is not absolutely necessary for five, you know, to have 5G in order to leverage on technology. 5G, of course, will make things better and faster. Uh, again, it depends on the deployment concept of the technology piece that we're talking about. Right? There are a lot of technology uh, or, or med tech devices that can run on its own without an internet connection. Um, it comes as a standalone package with its own compute processors, graphic cards, and everything. Right? And essentially, those can be deployed quite easily as a standalone stack in any environment. And you don't really need a 5G connection or a complex architecture to deploy those. Right. But if, let's say, we are looking at the, you know, building or deploying an integrated network where you have multiple you know, connections, remote devices coming in, you have real-time processing of images and data coming in from all over the place, um, then, of course, yes, you need a, an infrastructure that is able to support 
the amount of data that's being transmitted in real time and also the real time compute that's required to make sense of all this data. Now, is this needed in every single hospital? The answer is no. It really depends on, to me, the mandate and the strategy of the hospital. Right? You may need it in tertiary institutes or quaternary institutes where you are focused on not just clinical care, but research and development, and you're looking at building a lot of AI algorithms or deploying a lot of research models that relies on real-time patient data. And yes, that of course, those in institutes will need a very robust and complex backend infra to support the use cases that they're trying to do. Uh, but if let's say we're looking at a primary or secondary healthcare institute where you know, the main goal is to deliver healthcare and they don't need such complex systems, then you don't really need such a costly and complicated and intricate network of infrastructure in the background. What you need are the front end services that allows them to run the use cases and to deploy the use cases that they need to. And one option is of course to offload some of these high, you know, compute, high complexity requirements to a, a, another complex, right? For example, um, the cloud computer or even link up with another institute in order to support to support all these backend infra. Right. So all this can be done essentially in a multi-layer network. And I, I would say that it really depends on you know, what kind of technology that institute tries to deploy and the complexity that they're going for. And of course, also the level of integration that they're going to go for. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for Professor Shao. What triggered your research into this field? And what was the- Very good question. Very good question. It's about uh, students. So uh, students uh, and uh, postdocs are uh, joining my group. Uh, proposing uh, different types of ideas. And then uh, we believe this uh, can have a huge impact uh, to the society and also technological uh, innovative. And then I will just uh, answer the second question, right? What's the difference between this one and the existing uh, works on wearable ultrasound? Uh, number one is resolution. Uh, we are targeting at a uh, clinical uh, you know, ultrasound level because uh, we use a rigid ultrasound probe with bioadhesive ultrasound couplet, uh, no image distortion uh, in comparison to those uh, you know, stretchable ultrasound. Number two is uh, this uh, duration, uh, long-term uh, continuous, we can uh, you know, image uh, deep internal organs over days, uh, existing one, right? even though they claim it's viable, usually a few seconds or minutes. Uh, so number three, it's uh, really, uh, you know, the potential of a translation. Uh, if you imagine, uh, you know, <laughs> whether patients will adopt, uh, you know, something very similar to EKG, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, this kind of uh, modality or something uh, new that you need, uh, you know, do lots of uh, pre, uh, you know, application to apply on the uh, body. So these will be the key uh, differences. But, uh, you know, I'm glad to see this field and now is booming. Uh, many groups, uh, you know, developing different ideas uh, around the wearable ultrasound. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have for Chad. Is it possible to integrate software-based AI applications into pre-existing ultrasound machines so that developing countries can adopt it using their original machines? Yeah, certainly, great question. Um, you know, when I mentioned at the outset, the software is independent and vendor agnostic. Therefore, it means we've been trained by images generated. Our most recent uh, tech file for CE Marks had 17 different makes and models of manufacturer. So we wanted to build something that wasn't proprietary to any one manufacturer nor model. So images acquired off of, you know, mobile handheld as well as the latest top of the line machines. And it works hand in hand with, with essentially any packs. So depending on the packs, it's a little owl button in the viewer. Uh, if it's on a, a fleet of GE machines, you see the button there. We can take data from a Philips machine, use the calipers as an ROI to send the image data to the digital lab. And as I mentioned, we even had uh, are having conversations now where we can extend using Philips Lumify or GEV scan or butterfly, acquire those images. Those are those plug into a tablet, and that tablet will store the images. Our software can run directly on that tablet, 
analyze the image and have the finding right there. By building this to be local and be building it to be on-premise, we had to overcome the, the, the hurdle or obstacle, which would have been security and latency associated with being a full cloud deployment. So we're on-premise. It's a downloadable app. It's on your network. Um, a lot of times it takes us having to say that several times because they think it's CAD and they think it's cloud and it's, it's decision support and it's on-premise and on-device. So they ask us questions about our, our security. Our security is your security. It sits behind your firewall. No PHI ever leaves your premise. So it stays right there. That's the only way we can make it to be as fast because most of these places don't have the type of networks to, to allow for that speed. Also, they're not comfortable yet with the data that can move around. So it stays local. Okay. Thank you, thank you. It was a great panel discussion. I would like to hear some closing remarks uh, from uh, Dr. Sherhan Tang, sir, uh, regarding the entire webinar. He is the man behind the uh, getting all the speakers and organizing this, please, sir. Thank you, Gaurang, you're too kind. Actually, Gaurang was the one, uh, is the one who is uh, putting the entire webinar together. So, um, of course, we are on a, a webinar, and so I cannot get the audience to, um, you know, show their appreciation through applause, but I really want to uh, here thank our uh, esteemed panel. We are very fortunate uh, to have all of you here, despite the time zone differences. Um, you know, the uh, fantastic insights from all of you, um, you know, pushing the frontiers for what is actually a, a fairly mature technology, ultrasound, uh, through your innovations. And this, of course, leading to possibly the uh, reinventing our workflow and our capabilities for both the radiologists as well as the radiographers, sonographers. Um, so thank you so much for inspiring us with the exciting possibilities. Uh, I shall hand you back to uh, Gaurang and then we can perhaps close this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I thank everybody uh, for their active participation and great insights. Um, with this, I would like to end our webinar for today. And before we leave, I would like to request Sumit to display uh, the QR code for the feedback uh, so that all the participants and the delegates can fill their feedback form. Uh, we will be relaying this live session for a few days on the AOSR website, depending on the permissions we get uh, from the speakers. And after that, on our official YouTube channel. Uh, but I thank everybody who has attended. Please fill the feedback form to get your certificate of participation as a delegate in this webinar. We look forward for many such webinars in the coming times. Thank you.